This is Larry Lawton, and he's an ex-jewel thief. Larry's a former career criminal, once considered the biggest jewel thief in the United States. This is chapter 12, part one. It's called Abu Ghraib of America. Just to let you know what Abu Ghraib was, Abu Ghraib was a prison in Iraq that the American prisoners were torturing uh, Iraqi citizens in their jail there. The guards, uh, the American prison guards were torturing Iraqis. And we have that right here. We had that in Edgefield, South Carolina. It's called, and I and I called it Abu Ghraib, and I'll get get into this right now. So here I am. I uh, I gotta leave. I gotta leave Jessup, Georgia now. Where do I go? Back to the penitentiary. I'm going to Edgefield, South Carolina. And I thought, you know, here, wow, I'm hearing about Edgefield, pretty bad place. You know, brand new place, nice looking, but man, did they mess with you. The guards were worse than Atlanta, or as bad, or worse than Atlanta, and they didn't give a shit. I mean, they had a warden there named Lamana. I'll never forget his name. It's John Lamana. Boy, did he hate me. We ended up battling, and that fucker, man, to this day, I will never forget what he did to me. And, uh, you know, you... So anyway, here I go. I get transferred to Atlanta, and I get on the yard there. I had to go through what they call Captain's Review, Ken, and all that. I met a guy named Tallini. Paul Tallini, to this day, is a good friend. He got 30 years in prison uh, for selling coke. He ended up, he was he sold f uh, 50 kilos of coke in Miami. And he ended up getting 30 years sentence. And he did the whole 30. As a matter of fact, I picked him up uh, from when he got out of prison, actually, and helped him through his transition from getting out of prison into the real world. But anyway, so I meet Tallini. Tallini was a law nut, still is, super smart with the law. And Tallini got me more into the law. So I kept studying the law. I kept going to the law library. And I and I really started specializing in what they call the Code of Fegu Regulations. And that's what the federal government has to follow in prison. The Bureau of Prisons has to follow the Code of Fegu Regulations. So I'm studying. I could tell you every, every law they're supposed to follow. Like in the whole, you're supposed to be able to see a psychologist. If you're locked up in isolation or in the hole, you're supposed to see a psychologist every 30 days. And I don't mean just at the door. They're supposed to pull you out of the cell. They're supposed to evaluate you and see how crazy you got. Because being in the hole is one of the worst things we can do to human beings. People have no idea what it's like. And uh, they, they've found out that being in a hole makes you go crazy. So they're supposed to take you out of the cell. They're supposed to evaluate you every 30 days. They're supposed to give you three meals a day. They're supposed to give you recreation five days a week, meaning outside in fresh air. They put you in a cage, looks like a, a dog kennel cage, but it's considered recreation. Here's the thing. They don't do any of those things. They have a saying in the book that says they can avoid anything they're doing there, even feeding you. And they call it for the safe and orderly running of the institution. So if they don't want to give you recreation that day, they'll come up with some excuse and say for the safe and orderly running of the institution, we cancel recreation that day. Uh, I've been in a hole where they really do bad things and we're going to get into that now. So here I go. I go to Atlanta and I learn the code of figure regulations and in transfer, I was at Atlanta, I was still in the hole, and my mom, my grandmother died. I was very close to my grandmother. My grandmother didn't even know I went, what I went to prison for. She thought I went to prison for bookmaking, for being a gambler. She didn't know I went to prison for being the biggest jewel robber in the United States. So she was great. She was going to be 100 years old on, I'll never forget the date. She was on May 7th in 2003, she was going to be 100. My grandmother died on March 20th. 2003 five weeks before her 100th birthday and i and she even got the letter from the president of the united states if you turn 100 in the united states you actually get a birthday card from the white house 
she got that letter and I was very close with my grandmother. She was in good health, everything great. And I used to talk to her all the time. Well, she passed away. My mother called the prison system and says, listen, can you please send a pastor down and tell Larry his mother passed uh, his grandmother passed away and he's very close with her. They said, yes. Do you think they did it? Nah, they didn't do it. They're heartless. They're freaking heartless, the prison system. I don't know anything. I call my mother. I'll never forget. I call my mother on March 30th. I say, hey, mom, how you doing? She goes, yeah. They go, I go, how's grandma? She, she goes silent. She goes, they didn't tell you? Never forget this. She says, no. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, grandma died eight days ago. I'll tell you what, I'll never forget. I dropped my phone. I went back to my cell and I was laying in my cell. And that's when it really hit me, though, that I caused all these problems. I caused me missing my grandmother's funeral. They didn't get let you go to a funeral. I miss my kids. I miss my son's basketball. I miss my son growing up all the way through high school. I miss my daughter's recitals. I missed everything to do with my kids. And all because of my fault. So don't anybody ever get the idea that I'm blaming anybody else. It was because of my fault. I really screwed up and it was my choices that caused all this heartache and I'll never forget that and it, it drove me crazy. So here I am, I am uh, sent, transferred to Edgefield, South Carolina. Now Edgefield, South Carolina is a new prison. It's got the, the three units, almost like most of them, they got the guard station in the middle of where the paths come up and out. So it's totally pretty much like most prisons, but brand new. Pretty new prison, but the guards were real assholes. I used to play horseshoe, horseshoes with a guy named James Arch. Arch was a cell, three cells from me. Nice guy. He was an Indian, American Indian, and he was a good guy. He was four, he was forty three or forty four years old, something like that, in his low forties, mid to low forties. And we're playing horseshoes, and I'll never forget. He's he's got chest pains and arm pains. Typical pains of a heart attack. Typical pains of someone with a heart condition. And he goes to medical department. And here's what you're going to learn in this chapter. There is zero medical help in prison. I love when people say, oh, I'm going to go to prison and I'm going to get medical care. You're going to get nothing. You get zero medical care. And I'm going to tell you why here in a minute. So Arch goes to medical and they look at him and they say, nah, there's nothing wrong with you. Get out of here. Go back to the unit. So we're all talking to Arch and we know him and he's feeling bad all week. I mean, really looking bad and feeling bad. He feels so bad. He goes, he works in what they call uh, the prison industries. That's the, the people that's called CMS. And that's the people who handle the electrical, the plumbers, the, the carpenters, everything that works with the prison because they do everything. The inmates do everything in the prison. So he worked for them. He worked for the CMS. And the guard he worked for, one of they called the guards, every unit you have or every way you're in prison, you work for guards. So he works for a guard in the prison system and the guard tells him, hey, Arch, you look terrible. He goes, get to medical. He goes to medical, calls the medical, the guard does, calls the medical department, says, I'm sending an inmate down, check him out. So they check Arch, they, he goes to the medical, they check him, they go, get out of here, you got gas. So they say, you got gas, they give him Maalox. He walks back to the unit, never forget. Arch, it was about 100 yards from the medical unit to our unit. He walks back to the unit, he comes into the unit. Now, I'm standing there with a guy named Jimmy Brown, and we're looking at the TV sets. The TV sets are up on the wall, and there's, there's four TVs, and they're right on the wall, and they're set to a st specific station. They don't change them. And we're watching just TV. And it was about 11 in the morning, and in comes Wa Arch, and he comes through the main doors, and he sees us, and he looks at us, and he looks, and he goes, he says to Jimmy, never, never forget it. He says, Jimmy, I'm dying. We look at him. We put uh, Jim in a chair, in, like a plastic chair that's sitting there, and he gets in the chair and he keels over. Boom, he keels right over. Holy shit. He fucking look, he's not breathing nothing. We're trying to help him. Guards come over screaming, lockdown, lockdown. Now when they do that, you got to run to your cell. So everybody's running to their cells and the guards are there and we're wanting to help Arch. They're there. They come down with a, 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 a golf cart. They come down 
with a golf cart with a stretcher on it. And they come to get Arch. And I'll never forget when they picked up Arch and they put him on that on the stretcher to walk him out to the to the golf cart. There was a piss and shit on the floor, and that means you died. When you die, you defecate. Your body expels. So, I'll, this is what pissed me off. I'm looking out the little window, and my cell was right next to the door coming in and out of the unit, so I could see the guards out front putting Arch on the golf cart and they're laughing and joking. It fucking had me uh, livid. I was so mad. And they just, they drove him off and they were laughing in the back of the golf cart. And and now they do an investigation because we're all locked down and out comes SIS, the Special Investigative Services of the Prison, SIS. And they come to every one of the cells and they start asking, what happened? This happened. What'd you see? They come to our cell and they says, hey, you saw Arch hit his head, right? I said, what? You saw Arch hit his head. I said, fuck you. You guys killed that man as quick as you fucking stabbed somebody. You guys killed him. He just came from medical. And they didn't like that. So what do they do for me? Off to the hole I go. They throw me in the hole. I start fighting. I'm so pissed at the prison system. I start these letter writing campaigns that you wouldn't believe. I mean, I'm writing Senator Graham, Senator Hillary Clinton at the time. She was from New York. Uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I'm writing the Department of Justice. I'm writing everybody you can think of telling them about the, the deaths. Because while this happened, another friend of ours, a guy named Shiflet, he's in the next unit over and he's in his cell. We find out he has cancer. Well... He was getting worse and worse. The prison's not doing anything for him. He didn't even belong in this prison we're in. He should have been sent to a medical facility. He's in the cell, and he ends up at at night. This is now at night. He starts coughing up blood. He literally coughs up his whole lungs and everything else. Blood. There was pieces of blood and, and, and lung against the wall. He ends up dying. They don't get him out of his cell for over 30 minutes. Over 30 minutes, they let that man puke up his lungs and blood. The cell looked like a a slaughterhouse. Matter of fact, the guy who was his cellie was a redneck guy who worked in slaughterhouses, come from the, you know, where, you know, they butcher animals and stuff. He says, I've never seen a death like that in my life. And that's from with animals. He was his cellmate and he couldn't do anything for the guy. The guy literally died in front of him by puking up his guts, puking up his lungs, the blood. It was that bad. And they just let him die. They don't give a flying fuck. The prison system is is just the worst medical system in the world. And here's why. In the medical system in the Bureau of Prisons, that's contracted out. Meaning they hire an outside company to, to handle their medical do you think that medical company is going to do anything to help you? If you have hepatitis, you have any kind of illness, they don't want to help you. They want to get you out of the prison so it doesn't cost their company any more money. They're charging the people. You people who are watching this video, they're charging you. Because when an inmate gets out of prison, he's got to go to the healthcare system on the streets. And who pays for that? The taxpayer. This company who could have took care of a guy's illness, they don't take care of it. They don't give a crap. If you break your arm in prison, you break your arm, they'll give you Tylenol. Literally, they'll give you Tylenol. They do not care. My own medical condition, I'm a disabled vet from when I was in the service. And remember in the earlier chapters, I hurt my back. I crushed my spine. I got messed up. I'm a retired Coast Guard veteran. You think they tell help me? I'm fighting for the abuses. I'm fighting for my own health care. I'm writing every day. I'm writing every day. So I'm in the hole and I have law books. So these people die and another friend dies. So in, in, the, I was in A unit at the time. Uh, Shiflet was in B unit and this other guy was in C unit. Now, he's not feeling well. And they give his celly medication to give him at night, give him medication. Listen to this. So when they give him the medication, they tell him to give this guy the medication at night. Well, the guy goes to bed, 
gives him a little whatever before medication. The guy gets up in the morning and the guy is sitting dead in his chair, cold, dead. He was out, killed, dead for hours because the guy was just sitting there already cold and he, he just died in his cell. They just don't give a crap. What do you mean give a guy medical? How do you give the celly medication to give to somebody? So no, they don't do that. They take him and and he dies too. I'm starting to write. I learn the law. I'm wa- reading law books every day. In the hole, you get law books. And I'm reading the law. I'm writing senators. I am becoming the biggest pain in the ass to this prison. Lamana hates me. This guy, I'll never forget him, Lamana, John Lamana, the warden Lamana, he hates me. He hates Larry Lawton. He knows who Larry Lawton is. And one of the guards used to tell us, hey, Lawton, man, your name is being thrown around up there, man. You're not like, man. And he's telling me just like that. And what am I going to do? I got to keep fighting. I don't care. I keep fighting. I'm fighting for my own medical care, all, all that kind of stuff. So my letter writing keeps going. I'm writing the Washington Post. I'm writing the Freedom Magazines. I'm writing Arctic Beacon. I'm writing uh, uh, prison magazines. I'm writing everything, every person you can think of. I keep writing. So I get my records. I get my medical records. I find Dr. Serrano. Dr. Serrano is his name. He alters my records. He lies and alters my medical records to say I have no problems. How can't Lawton have problems? He's a retired veteran. I came from other prisons that had my medical records in there that I was given a, what they call a mattress or I was given soft shoes. I was given a lower bunk pass because I can't... How do you get up on a high bunk when you have a, a injury like I had? So Serrano alters my records and literally writes the senators back, the warden, does, saying I'm being taken care of, um, you know, getting the medical care I need. It's all bullshit. I'm getting nothing. And they lie to these senators. And I have the letters from prisons. I have them. I mean, it's crazy the, the amount of, of letters I had from senators and congressmen and all that kind of stuff that I'm fighting for myself to get medical care. I'm fighting for the deaths of people in prison. I'm going crazy. I'm in the hole. So I'm, while I'm in the hole, this kid jacks the food shot. Shoot. Let me tell you what jacking the food shoot is. I was telling you earlier, they feed you through a food shoot in prison, meaning they put the food right through this slot in the, in the, in the, in the door, and that's how they give you your food. So what does he do? Some guy... While they have the food chute open, they open all the doors and then they go down and feed people. This guy puts his arm through the food shot. They call that jacking the food shot. So they, the guard can't close it. So now you become a pain in the ass and they have to keep coming on the tier and they have to get try to get you to put that in. Or if not, they're going to come in there with the, the SWAT teams and the, uh, the goon squads and get your ass out of there and beat the shit out of you. But you jack the food shot. So this dude jacks the food shot. And it's crazy because everybody's going crazy in the hole. At this time, I'm in the hole. There's been times when I thought of suicide. I mean, my, my own self. I mean, it's just, you, you start going crazy. You know, it's, uh, you, you're not, you go crazy. You, you know, you, you get nothing. You, you, you start, you, your brain starts freaking going nuts. I thought of suicide. But the the will to live is better than that suicide thought, at least for me it was. But there's no question I thought of suicide. And I was starting to get beaten and and stuff of that nature, So, which I'm going to talk about more in the next video. But So this guy jacks the food shot. There are people on this tier going totally crazy. When you come on the tier in the hole, you're, they, op- they, they actually lock the whole tier down. There's a door at the end of the tier, it's locked. And then there's cells going down a tier. And they're all locked. So they lock and they don't care what you're doing, banging. And you're going crazy in the cell. You're hearing people go literally uh, 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 mental. We had one guy who kept singing and screaming and everybody's banging on the doors. And you're starting to go crazy yourself because this doesn't stop. This is 24-7. We had one guy who took the feces out of his ass and was writing demonic stuff on the walls. Think of that. How crazy are you to take feces 
and and write on the walls. And you're living in this. It's not like, you know, you're in this place and you're living in this kind of stuff. So this is the kind of stuff that's going on. And I'm in the hole this whole time going crazy. This guy jacks the food shot, uh, food shoot, and now the guards come on it. So there was a there was an ass. I'll never forget this. This asshole unit manager. He comes from the other prison, which is nearby. They have a, a, a minimum security prison. So he comes from the minimum security prison to come over to the, to the penitentiary where we were. And he comes in there and he's coming. He's actually talking shit to everybody at the door. He's like saying, ah, man, you deserve to be in here. Man, shut up. You don't got anything coming. That's what he'd say. You don't have anything coming. He told one guy, man, I know your wife's fucking around on you. And I'm like, this guy's fucking crazy. He's telling these crazy people as it is. He's making them go more crazy. He telling, he actually told a dude, I'll never forget that word. And he says, yeah, I know your wife's fucking around on you. How are you crazy what you do? So anyway, this guy's going down the whole tier and he's talking to everybody in the door. I used to sit up on the on the bunk or whatever bunk I was on. If I had my own cell, I'd be on the bottom bunk, obviously, depending on what bunk you're at. And I would sit in my bunk, and I never got up when that dog and pony show went by. That's when the, the unit managers, the lieutenants, the, you know, whoever it is, uh, the warden, associate wardens, they would come down, and they'd come down to tier and do that old dog and pony show. Hey, how you doing? Fuck you, man. I'm in the hole. How do you think I'm doing? I never even played played that game. I just laid in my bunk and I read a book. I, Fuck you. I don't give a shit what you fucking come by. So anyway, this guy's going down and I'm hearing, you could hear, everything you could hear, you could hear in the hole very well. So I'm hearing all this stuff and he's going down to talking shit to all the inmates. So all of a sudden I hear him screaming. Ah! He's screaming like a maniac. He's screaming like a maniac. And I get up, jump up on my, on, 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 out to the window, you know, at my door, and I look at the window, and he comes running by, and he is white with, with fucking curdled milk, piss, shit, the dude who jacked this food shot, food shoot, he made the concoction of the piss, and the shit, and curdled milk, in a container, he put it in it, and that's how bad it was, it was like, I will, I will never in my life, Forget the smell of that whole unit when that dude came running by and he was dripping with this shit. You know they had to fucking throw that shoot out. That was garbage. And obviously they give they give you what they call another shot or even a charge. That's assault in, in prison. That's assault on staff when you do that in prison. And they, they gave him an assault charge. He, like, he gives a fuck. And all of a sudden, boom, gets quiet. The unit's quiet now. Even the guy screaming and stuff all the time and singing, he got quiet. All of a sudden, we hear the door at the end of the end of the end of the tier open. You hear it, and you could hear it. It's very quiet then. You could hear the keys. You could hear doors rattling, doors roll, and you hear you could hear a bunch of footsteps. All of a sudden, what do they do? They start covering the windows. Now, they used to cover the windows with a magnetic piece that from the outside of the door would cover the window so we in the cells can't see what's going on outside. And the reason they do that is so you can't see them beat the living shit out of somebody. And when I say beat them, in one time when I was in the hole, I told you I was in Atlanta, I heard them snap a dude's leg and you could hear the snap of the leg literally hear the snap of the leg and that, and they beat this guy probably half to death you don't you didn't hear a thing all you hear is moaning then and when i say you hear moaning all night it's the saddest thing in the world you're literally hearing people moan and I, when i say moan i mean moaning for the you know i i've been there i was beaten like that and i'm going to talk about that in the next chapter i mean the next part of this chapter I was in that hole for 11 straight months, but I'm going to tell you what happened to me in that hole in the next chapter. So it's going to be pretty wild. Thanks for watching. I'm going to end this chapter now. You guys know you can listen to this whole book reading on Spotify and on uh, iTunes in the links below. Our merchandise is in the mix below or in that tab up there on YouTube. 
donate, do whatever you want to do. You can help me out. Like I said, I'm just doing this now full time. I got some great, great videos in the works. And I really want to thank everybody for the comments and stuff. Follow us on Instagram. You can do that as well. Uh, in chapter, in the next chapter, this is chapter uh, 12, part 2. You're going to find out what they did to me. And I'll tell you what, I'm getting the chills, man. I don't even want to do it, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to talk about it. So thanks for watching. See you next, uh, next time. And it'll be a couple days. You're going to get the next chapter. Have a great day. Think before you act. Thanks for watching.